The Gospel of the Second Sunday in Ordinary Time brings us back again to the story of Jesus' public life and to the um, account of the wedding feast at Cana that we find in John's Gospel. It is the first of Jesus' miracles, or signs, as John calls them. Now, as soon as we begin looking at this story, a number of questions come up, like how did the, uh, those hosting the party run out of wine, and how did Mary find out about it? Even more interesting is the interchange between Jesus and his mother Mary. Mary simply makes a statement, they've run out of wine. But clearly, either from her tone of voice or the look on her face, Jesus got that she expected him to do something about it. His response reminded me of my adult daughter's response when I ask her to take the garbage out or remind her that the dog needs to be walked. Jesus said, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. But with classic good parenting skills, Mary refused to get drawn into the argument and instead simply told the servers to do whatever he said. And we know how the story ends. With the six jars of water becoming wine and actually the best of wine and the wedding party being saved. But there's a final sentence in that story that I want to look at and want us to reflect on. John writes at the end, Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee and so revealed his glory and his disciples began to believe in him. So he revealed his glory, and the disciples began to believe in him. This is a theme in John's Gospel, the notion of the glory of God, the glory of God being revealed in Jesus. And that glory that is revealed in Jesus is a glory that participates in God's glory. Jesus' act of kindness, his response to a family in need, glorified God and led his disciples to believe in him. Now, the idea that the glory of God is dynamic and expansive can be traced out in our Old Testament reading as well. At this point in Isaiah, the Israelites are beginning to end their time in captivity. They're ending the time in exile. They're returning home. Through the action of God, the Israelites are set free. And as Isaiah writes, nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. As in the gospel, it is the action of God that brings glory to to Israel, a glory that reflects the glory of God. Now, we could do an interesting word study on the meaning of glory in John's gospel or the way it's used in Isaiah or whatever, but I think instead I'd like to turn to what's the most important theological question that we ask about this material, which is, so what? So what does this mean for how I live my life? for how I raise my children, spend my money, how I live as a Christian in the world. Let me propose three points for us to think about. First, the reading from Isaiah highlights the saving, liberating activity of God through which the glory is shown to the Israelites and on to reflect on God. The writer of this section of Isaiah writes, No no more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate, but you shall be called my delight and your land espoused. What struck me in that is how important it was for the Israelites to claim that new identity. They had experienced themselves as forsaken, as desolate for so long that being told now they were in fact my delight, my beloved, must have been a hard adjustment for them. And I think sometimes we have a similar challenge. I wonder sometimes how well we embrace the reality of God's great love for us, that we are ourselves beloved of God. We are ourselves one who reveals God's glory. This invites us into a response of humble gratitude. So that's the first way that I think we reflect the glory of God by a stance of humble gratitude, an awareness of God's love for us that we give expression to in that way. Second, as we return to the gospel story, 
we see that Jesus's action were low key, no drama, simple responses of kindness. And yet they had significant power on the event. And we see that throughout the gospels, Jesus's times of kindness, of forgiveness, of mercy, of healing, had significant impact on the people involved. Now, I'm not reducing the call to the gospel to being nicer to one another, although clearly that would be nice if we were, but rather simply reminding us that the gestures of care and compassion are essential ways in which we live the gospel. There are central ways in which we reveal the glory of God, this being done in small ways, as well as through changes in structures and through preaching the gospel. We reveal God's presence in the, and, and glory in the everyday actions of life through the kindness we, expose, we show to one another. Thirdly, if we again look back to the gospel reading, to the beginning of that gospel, we're reminded that it was Mary who set the work into action. What led her to invite Jesus to take action in this, uh, in this event, to respond to this particular need? Perhaps she recognized a change in him, a, a new sense of purpose. While Jesus might have protested, my time has not yet come, Mary didn't agree with him. So Mary models for us a third way that we reflect God's presence and glory. By encouraging, inviting, nurturing others to use their gifts. Gifts given for the good of the community. We see that in the second reading today and hope that those who feel that their voices have not been heard or who feel that their time is not now and may never be can hear words of encouragement and strength. We can reveal God's glory by reminding ourselves and others that the nurturing moms in our lives are usually right. So as we move into this second week in ordinary time, May we be those who intentionally reflect God's glory through a sense of gratitude, through actions of kindness, and by nurturing within one another the voices that preach the gospel in word and action.